Tucked away in the rolling hills of East Tennessee, Harriman's old historic hospital is a decaying monument to the past. Its skeletal brick and mortar remain still defiant against time, though the once pristine white walls are now stained with rust, mold, and the passage of untold years. Since the 1970s, the building has been abandoned, slowly being swallowed by the earth around it. And yet, the locals speak of the hospital with fear and reverence, for many believe it is a place where time stops and where the dead walk freely among the living. Built in 1929, the old historic Harriman Hospital stood as a beacon of hope for the rural communities that surrounded it. Before its construction, the nearest medical facilities were hours away, and too many lives were lost on the journey for care. Doctors and nurses were drawn to the hospital from all corners of Tennessee, eager to serve in what was hailed as a modern medical facility. But they soon discovered that the promises of state-of-the-art care were fragile dreams, shattered by the grim reality they would face. The hospital opened its doors in the aftermath of World War I, but just two years later, the stock market crash of 1929 plunged the country into the Great Depression. What was meant to be a symbol of progress quickly became a place of desperation. The people of Harriman and the surrounding areas, already struggling with poverty, turned to the hospital not only for medical care, but also for shelter and food. The hospital staff, themselves affected by the economic collapse, found their resources stretched thin. Scarcity became the new reality. Inside the hospital, wards that were designed to hold 10 patients were often filled with 30 or more. There were no proper sanitation facilities for such overcrowding. The air in the wards grew thick with the smell of illness, gangrene, tuberculosis, pneumonia. Even the walls seemed to absorb the misery. The most haunting part of the hospital was the maternity ward, where women in labor were brought in with little hope of survival. It wasn't uncommon for both mother and child to die within hours of admission. A single doctor would often be responsible for dozens of patients running from room to room in a futile attempt to keep them alive. But for every patient they saved, another two died. Desperation led to horrifying decisions. Nurses driven to the edge of sanity would ration medicine based on who they thought had the best chance of survival. If you were too old, too sick, or simply in too much pain, you might be left to die while stronger patients received what little medicine remained. Whispers circulated about euthanasia. Patients who were beyond saving, it was said, were sometimes given fatal doses of morphine to ease their suffering and free up a bed. Those rumors were never proven, but the tales continued to haunt the town long after the hospital closed. But the Great Depression wasn't the first shadow to fall over Harriman Hospital. Its first brush with death came a decade earlier, during the influenza pandemic of 1918. The hospital hadn't officially opened at the time, but its construction was already nearing completion, and the government requisitioned it as a temporary medical center to handle the wave of death sweeping across the nation. Even before the first patient was brought in, the building seemed cursed. The bodies began arriving faster than they could be buried. Entire families were brought to the hospital, their skin blue from lack of oxygen, their eyes wide with panic as they gasped for air. A single cough could send patients into violent convulsions, spewing blood-tinged froth from their mouths as they suffocated. The hospital's unfinished basement became a temporary morgue as the steady stream of corpses overwhelmed the local burial grounds. Bodies were stacked two or three high, waiting for mass graves to be dug in the outskirts of town. It was in that basement that the first stories of strange occurrences began. Doctors and nurses, already numb from the sheer volume of death, started to hear whispers in the shadows. They would descend into the basement to place a body, only to hear the faintest moans coming from the piled corpses. The sound of labored breathing echoed through the cold, damp corridors. Staff began to suspect that some patients were buried alive, mistaken for dead in the chaos of the pandemic. 
panic spread through the hospital. Were they hearing the cries of the living, or were the dead refusing to stay buried? A string of mysterious deaths followed. Patients who had seemingly recovered from the flu died suddenly and without explanation. One night, a doctor entered the ward to find a young boy sitting up in his bed, his face pale and eyes wide open in fear. His monitor showed no heartbeat. It was as if death had visited him in his sleep and taken him without a sound. The following morning, the same doctor was found dead in his office, his face frozen in the same expression of terror. Staff began reporting a sense of being watched during the night shifts. Nurses would walk the long, dimly lit hallways and feel a presence just behind them, though when they turned, there was nothing but shadows. Sheets would be stained with blood in the morning, even though none of the patients had bled. Other times, patients would wake in the middle of the night, screaming that someone, or something, had been sitting on their chest, making it impossible for them to breathe. Doctors, pragmatic by nature, initially dismissed these events as stress and exhaustion. But the deaths continued, and so did the fear. An aura of dread began to cling to the hospital. Even the most seasoned medical professionals felt its weight. Some patients would beg to be taken elsewhere, convinced that death awaited them if they stayed. Those too, weak to leave, became resigned to their fate. They knew the hospital had turned into something more than a place of healing. It had become a place where the living and the dead brushed shoulders. The line between life and death blurred as strange shadows flitted across walls. Disembodied footsteps echoed through empty corridors and patients whispered of visitors no one else could see. By the time the hospital officially opened in 1929, it had already garnered a reputation as a haunted place. Even the locals spoke of it in hushed tones, warning each other not to go near the basement or the maternity ward at night. Something dark had taken root in the hospital during its time as a pandemic triage center, and it seemed to have never left. The stories of unexplained deaths, shadowy figures, and cold drafts continued well into the hospital's operational years. To many, it felt as though death had made a permanent home in the building. It wasn't just that people died there, it was that the very walls seemed to draw life out of them, turning their last breaths into echoes that would never fade. And for some, those echoes became a call they could never escape. No name is more closely tied to the haunting of old Harriman Hospital than that of Nurse Alice Burroughs a figure whose story has become intertwined with both the building's history and its eerie atmosphere. Alice Burroughs was known among her peers as a dedicated and compassionate caregiver. She had a gentle, maternal presence that comforted even the most frightened patients. Her hands were steady, her voice calm, and no one doubted her skill or her commitment. But as the hospital became overwhelmed during the influenza pandemic and later through the Great Depression, Alice's compassion became an obsession. The lines between her professional duties and personal emotions blurred, and the consequences would be deadly. During the height of the pandemic, when the hospital's wards were filled with the dying and the dead, Alice was often the last person many patients saw before they slipped away. She worked longer hours than any other nurse, refusing to leave even when she could barely stand. Her colleagues began to worry that she was pushing herself too hard, that the strain was breaking her. But what was more disturbing were the whispers that began to circulate among the night staff. Alice had started to behave strangely. Several nurses reported seeing Alice in the late hours, whispering to patients who had already died. She would sit by their bedsides, her head bowed, murmuring as though trying to soothe them. At first, her colleagues dismissed it as a way of coping with the constant stream of death. After all, who wouldn't be broken by the overwhelming loss she faced day after day? But the behavior became more unsettling. Witnesses claimed that she didn't just talk to the bodies, she seemed to have full conversations with them, turning her back to the empty beds as though someone were there.
One nurse swore that she saw Alice holding the hand of a patient who had passed away hours earlier, gently caressing it, her lips moving in quiet conversation. When the nurse tried to speak to Alice, she didn't respond. She sat, transfixed, her eyes hollow and distant, as if she had stepped into another world entirely. When confronted about these strange interactions, Alice would brush it off, saying that it was her way of ensuring the patients were at peace. But behind her calm exterior, something much darker was festering. The most chilling part of Alice's story is the doomed love affair that would seal her fate. In 1918, Henry Faulkner, a soldier freshly returned from the horrors of World War I, was admitted to the hospital, suffering from a severe case of influenza. His body was battered by war and illness, and many of the staff doubted he would survive. Henry was placed under Alice's care, and despite his critical condition, she became fiercely determined to save him. As Alice spent more time by Henry's side, tending to his fever and holding his hand through his delirium, a deep bond formed between them that went far beyond the usual nurse-patient relationship. Henry, haunted by the memories of battle, would often wake in the night screaming or muttering incoherently about things he had seen in the trenches. He spoke of the dead soldiers who visited him in his dreams, of gas attacks, and the unbearable weight of survivor's guilt. Alice, already on the edge of the overwhelming death surrounding her, found herself becoming emotionally entangled with Henry's suffering. She believed irrationally that she could save him from not only the illness, but the war that still raged in his mind. It wasn't long before whispers spread through the hospital staff about the closeness between Alice and Henry. Some claimed they saw her sitting by his bed for hours, even when she wasn't on duty, reading to him or whispering words of comfort. Others said that the bond between them had become something more than professional, that Alice had fallen deeply in love with him. Whether or not this was true, it was clear that Alice's obsession with saving Henry had overtaken her. But in the cold, harsh reality of the pandemic, love was not enough to fend off death. One autumn night, Henry's fever worsened. Despite Alice's best efforts, Henry slipped away his chest heaving with labored breaths before falling silent. When Alice discovered his lifeless body in the early morning hours, something inside her broke. The staff who were present that night reported hearing her scream, a blood-curdling primal sound that echoed through the darkened corridors. She wept over his body, begging him to come back to her, refusing to accept that he was gone. In her grief-stricken state, Alice locked herself in the room with Henry's body. For hours, she was left alone with him, cradling his cold form and whispering words of love, her mind spiraling further into madness. When the staff finally forced the door open the next morning, they found Alice lying next to Henry, her arms wrapped around his lifeless body, a vial of morphine in her hand. She had taken her own life, unable to face a world without him. Though Alice's body was buried alongside Henry's, it was clear to those who worked at the hospital that her spirit never left. In the days following her death, strange occurrences began to plague the second floor where she had died. Nurses working the night shift reported seeing a figure in a white uniform wandering the halls, her footsteps eerily silent. At first, they thought it was just their imagination, but soon the sightings became more frequent and more terrifying. Alice's ghost wasn't a comforting presence. Her once gentle and caring demeanor had twisted into something far more malevolent. Patients would wake in the middle of the night to find her standing at the foot of their beds, staring at them with hollow, grief-stricken eyes. Some claimed to feel the icy touch of her hand on their foreheads, as though she were checking their temperature. Yet when they opened their eyes, no one was there. Others said they felt her weight pressing down on their chest, suffocating them as if she were trying to draw them closer to death. Nurses who dared to work alone at night would feel a cold breeze pass by them, followed by the faint sound of crying. Some claimed that they could hear Alice calling out for Henry, 
her voice distant yet filled with sorrow. A few of the braver nurses tried to communicate with her spirit, leaving small tokens or saying prayers for her soul, but nothing seemed to calm her restless ghost. In time, Alice's presence became a symbol of fear. Staff avoided the second floor after dark, and patients who were assigned to rooms in that wing would often beg to be moved, claiming they could feel her watching them. One patient, a young woman recovering from surgery, was found dead in her bed one morning. Her face was twisted in terror, her body cold despite the warm blankets. The doctors could find no cause of death. Some said Alice had come for her in the night. As word spread about the hauntings, the hospital itself became synonymous with death. Alice's spirit was no longer just tied to the second floor. Her presence was felt throughout the entire building. Shadows would move along the walls where no light could cast them, and doors would slam shut without warning. And always there was the sound of footsteps in the distance, the faint rustling of a nurse's uniform moving through the halls. Some say that Alice is still searching for Henry, unable to accept that death has claimed him. Others believe that her spirit remains bound to the hospital by the overwhelming guilt and grief she carried with her in life. Whatever the reason, one thing is clear. Alice's ghost has made the old Harriman Hospital her eternal home, and those who encounter her seldom leave without feeling the chill of her sorrow. One of the darkest and most terrifying places within the hospital is the basement, where hundreds of influenza victims were stored before their burials. Cold and damp, the air in the basement always felt unnaturally heavy, as though the spirits of the dead lingered just beneath the surface. It is said that the morgue, long since emptied of bodies, still holds onto the whispers of those who died there. Visitors to the hospital have reported hearing the unmistakable sound of gurneys rolling across the floor, though no one is there. Some claim to have heard the faint groans of patients suffering their final moments, and many refuse to descend into the basement, believing it to be a portal where the living can become trapped between life and death. Urban explorers, armed with cameras and digital recorders, often come seeking proof of the paranormal. More often than not, they leave with nothing but terror. One group of thrill-seekers ventured down to the basement in 2004, hoping to capture EVPs, electronic voice phenomena. They spent an hour in total silence, asking questions, hoping to hear a response. As they played back the recording, they heard it. A soft voice, barely audible, whispering, Leave before it's too late. Alice's presence is strongest on the second floor, where she and Henry both met their untimely ends. Many visitors have claimed to see a figure in a nurse's uniform, standing silently at the end of the corridor. Those brave enough to approach often feel a bone-chilling cold, as if they've crossed into a different plane of existence. A few who dared to stay too long report being followed by her for days after leaving the hospital, experiencing strange dreams and waking to see her shadow at the foot of their bed. In 2010, a paranormal investigation team spent the night inside the hospital. One of the investigators, a seasoned ghost hunter, became violently ill after visiting the second floor. He described the sensation as though something was draining the life out of him. He later told his team that he had seen Alice, her face twisted in a silent scream, as she reached out toward him with icy hands. They ended the investigation early, and the investigator swore never to return. Locals avoid the hospital, particularly in October, when the veil between the living and the dead is thinnest. On Halloween night, the bravest daredevils will sometimes approach, standing just outside the gates. It's said that if you listen closely on that night, you can hear the faint sobs of a woman, perhaps Alice, still grieving for the lost souls she could not save. And if you're unfortunate enough to catch a glimpse of her, it's best to leave immediately, for those who encounter Alice's ghost are said to be cursed, followed by her presence until they meet a tragic fate themselves.
The old historic Harriman Hospital stands as a chilling reminder of the price of obsession and grief. Even in its ruin, it holds the echoes of lives long gone, and some say that once you enter, a part of you never truly leaves. The Dead Demand Company, and they're always looking for new souls to join them. Will you be the next?